Good morning. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, as I hopefully you all know, today is Alzheimer's Action Day, so we're really excited to be having this uh, town hall and they're all participating. We're going to go ahead and start. There was quite a few more of you uh, expected to attend. Maybe some traffic delays is what we're thinking of parking in the Bay Area here, so we'll just let people uh, trickle in as, as they do and kind of continue on. Um, just a few logistics. There's uh, restrooms across the hall if you haven't found them. Please help yourself to any more coffee, water, or food. Um, and um, I know many of you have prepared comments today, or maybe not, but, it, but we'll be inspired to speak today about something. Uh, you can grab my attention or my colleague Sarah's, and we'll, we'll come over with you in a mic so everybody can go ahead and hear you. Uh, I'll keep my um, comments brief, but without further delay, we'll get this thing started. I'm gonna, kick it over to our fabulous CEO, Bill Fisher. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you, and thanks for being with us. Um, as Kimberly said, we think we'll be joined by some others. I hadn't even thought of this, but some people I, I'm told are probably outside looking for the space shuttles. So, <laughs> it was flying over this morning, so we'll see. We'll hope they got to see it, and then they can join us. So it's great to be with you. The purpose of this meeting is to hear from this community about what it's like to live with Alzheimer's in this community. This community as you define it, uh, whether it's Oakland or Northern California. Um, we, have, we're, we, the Alzheimer's Association, are doing a series of about 70 of these town hall meetings. I was in Reno last week for a, a similar kind of gathering. I uh, heard from that community, different issues for some of those folks, right? Dis issues of of what it's like to live in rural America and issues of transportation challenges in rural America. We may hear about transportation challenges in urban and suburban America today. So this comes on the heels, I, I've been with the Alzheimer's Association 25 years and uh, you know I, I was here when there were no drug treatments for Alzheimer's and I was here when Cognex was approved and then Aricep was approved and now we have four drug treatments, of, uh, symptomatic treatments approved by the FDA. But I will tell you, I think the single biggest thing that's happened in my 25 years happened last March when the Department of Health and Human Services released the first ever national plan for Alzheimer's disease. And this was our baby. Uh, in January of 2011, the president signed into law the National Alzheimer's Project Act. We had worked on this for two years, worked the administration, worked the Congress. It was passed on a bipartisan basis with near unanimous support. And then the president signed it into law, as I say, uh, in January. And out of that came a national conversation among the federal agencies that have responsibility for this. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the National Institutes of Health, where the research funding resides in our country, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, and a citizen advisory panel uh, on which our own Jerry Wolfolk here uh, from Oakland was a member. We were very de just delighted to have someone from Northern California uh, serve along with Ron Peterson the, from the Mayo Clinic and our national CEO, Harry Johns, and, and, a, and a host of, of uh, significant people in our movement, and, and Jerry is part of that. So you were represented in her. Now we had the success of the plan, the first plan. And I don't know what you, I'm going to guess there are various opinions about plans, but I live in an organization that takes plans very seriously. And today's meeting and these other 70-some uh, town hall meetings across the country are intent, intended to be part of our effort to breathe life into this plan. We want to pay attention to this. We want to continue to use this information to go back to our public officials and ask for a response. I would also note that in 2011, California developed and released its first ever state plan for Alzheimer's disease. And Sherry Matza, who's sitting here, led that effort. Sherry's former board member of the Alzheimer's Association in Northern California, Northern Nevada, um, has a, a personal experience with Alzheimer's, both she and Jerry, um, and has been just a champion of advocacy and policy efforts for families with Alzheimer's disease in our territories. We appreciate having both of them with us today. Uh, so that's what this is about. You are content providers this morning. 
So as Kimberly said, you're going to get up and, and, and you're, uh, talk to us. There are going to be microphones. People, raise your hand. People will come around. Uh, we, we'd ask you, uh, when we did this session in Reno, when we got to the end of it, there were still people with their hands up who didn't get to speak. So try to make your, your remarks uh, as brief as possible. Edit them down if you can. Uh, and if you want to speak a second or third time later on, that's fine too. So a couple of things. Uh, again, I introduced Sherry and Jerry, and, I'm, and they're going to be part of the part of the listening panel here this morning. We're also expecting uh, Danielle Quintanella, uh, senior congressional aide to Congresswoman Barbara Lee. We we think she's going to join us. We also are expecting uh, Mayor Jean Juan. Uh, she had a previous meeting and hopes to get here about 11:15. So when she does, we'll recognize that, and then she'll say a few words at the end of our session today. Uh, so again, we appreciate all of you being with us. We appreciate the audience. Uh, so we're going to address five separate issues. So I'd like you to think about these, and you can do them in any particular order you like uh, as it relates to your personal experience of living with Alzheimer's disease or a related disorder. But we're gonna t we want to hear what your experience and thoughts are about stigma, and public awareness. Stigma and public awareness. If you Today um, was released the World Alzheimer's Report, and the World Alzheimer's Report talks a lot about stigma and Alzheimer's disease. I always think it's, it's it, I, I always use Re President Reagan as the example for this. So here was the great communicator, leader of the free world, governor of California, shared in this poignant letter, uh, shared his experience with the country on a Saturday, and it was in every Sunday paper across the country the next day, and then he disappeared from the fight. It's one thing to say, Bill, you don't run as fast as you used to run, and that's true. Um, but it's a whole different thing to say, Bill, you don't think as well as you used to think. It's a different kind of illness, isn't it? Uh, and then we'd like to hear about diagnosis and care delivery. Diagnosis. What's your experience with the physician community, the medical community? Uh, and then research. Any thoughts about research and where research is? I have a lot of thoughts about them, and maybe I'll share them uh, at the end of this. Uh, and then support for caregivers. Support for caregivers. A lot of our work as the Alzheimer's Association is done with the caregiving community. They're the people who often reach out to us. And finally, long-term care. Long-term care as you know it and define it. We could be talking about home and community-based care, people who come into the home. When my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's, we had someone come in and bathe her uh, two or three days a week. Uh, maybe it's daycare. Maybe it's assisted living. Maybe it's skilled nursing. What's your experience with long-term care? So I think we're ready to go. Uh, so raise your hand if you've got something to say. Maybe we can think about any thoughts about stigma and public awareness. Here we are on September, uh, uh, World Alzheimer's Month, and uh, the 21st is Alzheimer's Action Day. Uh, if you saw on, if you saw the NBC crew this morning on the air, they're all wearing purple at our request. And Dennis O'Donnell, of, who's been a great champion, Dennis O'Donnell's the sports anchor on uh, CBS 5, KPEX. Uh, and Dennis lost his father to Alzheimer's, and he's wearing his purple Alzheimer's tie on, on air today. So anyway, what about stigma awareness? Barbara, uh, someone will bring you a microphone, right? Other shoulder, there you go. I live up in the Oakland Hills, and one of the populations that's up there is single people. There are tons and tons of single people. They may have been never married, they may be divorced, they may be widowed or widowered, um, with or without family. Many of them have no children of their own, or the children live in Timbuktu, figure in whatever far away place you want to be. Um, what, hap what I've seen happen in the neighborhoods are they get called crazy as they walk down this path. Um, people call the police. Um, people distrust them. They don't, you know, especially people that didn't know them for 20 years. Um, it's very hard. Outreach is very hard, and I, I, don't, you know, that's one of the things that I think is very important to figure out. It's a population that we have no um, real definition of. And 
seriously stigmatized, I believe, and, and unable to, to stand up for yourself and say, well, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just losing my marbles. <laughs> Thank you. And so it's it's a comment rather than a question. There's I don't know the answer. Susan. We meet again. Yes, we can. Hi, my name's Susan, and um, I'm here with my friend. Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it really easy to remember. Um, stigma, stigma, stigma is something I learned in my early career, which had to do with alcoholism and I find myself as a volunteer, as a family member, and as a friend again dealing with another A word, Alzheimer's. And um, what I have loved a lot of people who were older than I and who have had Alzheimer's and now my dear friend has been diagnosed with early onset. Um, Sorry, that just cut me for a minute there. Love you. Anyway, we're here today because we are on the political advocacy bandwagon. And I would just like to say that one of our ideas is that we address Alzheimer's as a family system illness. And that our, whether you support the Affordable Care Act or somebody else's act, um, We'd really like to promote the idea of learning about Alzheimer's in the same way you do about advanced care directives, only sort of like in your 20s, instead of waiting till you have an end of life experience as an older person or as an older family person or as an older friend of a person. We, we'd like to see stigma move from just the stigma of Alzheimer's to an, an issue that could be addressed by family members, just like cancer, breast cancer, de depression. If you have it in your family, you should maybe pay attention a little earlier than when you're 92. So, you know, I'd like to see that family system issue being really addressed. I feel like we share, we, <laughs> we share Alzheimer's. One person has the physical diagnosis, and the rest of us have all the rest of it, too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Did I see Tenny? I saw Tenny. Tenny, in a minute, I'm gonna in a minute I'm gonna ask you to say a word about what it's like, what you what your perspective is on Alzheimer's in the Chinese community. Anyone else with a comment about, yeah. Uh, hello, for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Zach, and um, I have a grandmother that was diagnosed with Alzheimer's relatively young, and um, we've just hit every possible bump on the road. Um, in a, if, as if the disease itself weren't bad enough, we, um, we struggled with a lot of uh, sort of corruption in the elder care industry. We had one caregiver that sold $47,000 worth of jewelry from my grandmother. And um, that was just, that was something that just didn't need to happen. It was a terrible detriment to my family. And um, as is the whole disease. And um, what I'll say on the, the stigma aspect of this is that I, from my perspective, I can see that I think the greatest stigma may be at the state and federal levels, or with the state state level specifically, because um, I was um, when I was interning with the Alzheimer's Association, I listened in on a call, and I was um, incredibly shocked to find that um, a disproportionate number of people um, who were uh, considered presumptively eligible for the community-based adult services program were. Um, denied on the basis of dementia, and um, it really upset me that a disproportionate amount of the people who were denied for that were had a documented diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Um, and I think that the state, you know, um, the state knows that these people are disproportionately more expensive to take care of. And um, you know, from my perspective, I can see that this can only set our movement back, which is, of course, very unfortunate. So I think that's something that the public needs to be aware of. It's going on um, in the elder care industry. And I also 
will say that um, I think when we're dealing with any issue in sort of public health or human rights, we really don't have anything without awareness, and I think we can never have too much public outreach and public awareness because we can't really expect our, our public, our, our community, and our public sector to support us if we don't um, promote our cause as much as we possibly can. And from that, we form some, you know, these incredible public-private partnerships that have been appearing, and um, that's something that I think needs to continue. And um, to address the, um, uh, to sort of expand on awareness, I think what we need to do is sort of promote awareness to a younger group of advocates, people who are my age, who are students, because they need to understand that if the statistics rise as they're projected to do by 2050, that it's people my age, it's our generation, that will be paying quite literally out of our pockets for this incredibly large baby boom generation, which will, um, for which the prevalence of Alzheimer's is going to increase dramatically. And um, we need to be aware of that, and it's one thing I'm working on in college and I hope to continue to do. And I think we also, um, I think I would just also say that I think one thing we need to promote with this disease is that, you know, at the end of the day, we have to remember that this disease um, ultimately is really not about the statistics and the, you know, the rising data, but I think mostly it's about the incredible measure of just human suffering. And um, I think that we need to, that if we can convey that, we have the greatest chance of creating sort of an Alzheimer's free world. Okay. Zach, thanks very much. You may have noticed we were joined uh, while Zach was speaking by Mayor Jean Kwan. Hello. Madam Mayor, welcome. Welcome. And welcome. Thank you for being with us. Well, welcome to you. I'm excited to come here today. Um, welcome to you, and um, I'm only going to be able to sit in a little while. Um, I understand this is a regional meeting, and I wanted to say that a lot of people don't know my first life. Um, I was actually a patient advocate, and that my husband is Dr. Floyd Hume, who was the medical director at over six seasons, just stepped down for being the medical director to work on some other issues. But um, he was one of the first founders of CAPA, which is a thousand California physicians who believe in single pair. So that's where our family comes from, and I think that's part of the solution for the, the growing cost of medical care in general, much less um, the, the growing retirement and aging of my generation, and I always tell the next generation young man that uh, I'm really sorry, we're gonna be healthier and longer and more cantankerous, we're used to being the center of attention our whole lives, so we're probably not gonna be easy to deal with um, as, a, as a generation, but um, it's also an amazing opportunity because many of us will be healthy in our retirements and be able to give back to the community, and I think that's actually part of the solution, too. Um, I don't think President Obama would have won without all the retirees that worked on this campaign. I don't think um, right now in a lot of the volunteer efforts I have, whether it's mentoring in the schools or just doing self-help and neighborhood organizing. I have a couple of good old friends here who have literally been PTA presidents with me, and um, Barbara's on the Vegetation Management Board, people who are in, in their retirement or in, the, in their old, <clears throat> our older, more senior years are still pretty active in the community, and then they have to be part of the solution. The boomers aren't just the problem, but they can be a big part of, of the solution because you know, they're going to be healthier and active and kicking around for probably another couple of decades um, of really productive uh, giving back to community. But welcome, it's an important topic. It's something I know that I monitor that probably is begin beginning to touch the lives of every boomer, either through our parents or our neighbors or our friends, um, um, and something that, that we really have to pay attention to. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I was thinking when Zach, when you were talking about your generation having to pay for the baby boomers, I was reminded of the Walt Kelly Pogo line about I met the enemy and he was us. Uh, he says as a 64 year old, Tenny, I wanted to put you on the spot because Tenny sighs back here and we just had a, uh, a press conference next door to introduce the Chinese portal to our national website. And I just wanted to, Tenny uh, Sai served on our board of directors. She was chair of our board of directors for two years. She served on the national board of directors. And, and I, was, I, I quote Tenny often because I remember when I first met Tenny telling me that when her grandmother had Alzheimer's, I thought we were the only Chinese family 
who was touched by this condition. So I think there, stigma is an issue for all of us and for every family and every person with Alzheimer's, and it varies from community to community. Well, good morning. Um, I, I think Bill was right. When 25 years ago I had to deal with the problem with her, my grandmother, we thought was the only one, until we went to a, a first program rowing game, and I realized, my goodness, there's other people like us. Um, but still, I was the only Chinese, except there was a young lady, I shared that just in the conference call, some of you heard this, but I think it's important to share this story, that uh, who lives from Chinatown, San Francisco, and uh, she, she said, she listened to us, she said, oh my goodness, that's where my father died from just two months ago. And I never knew this was such a disease exist. And where were you? Where were you? He said, my mother, because the behavior, agitation, everything, so we thought that he was mentally ill. And, and then my mother forbid us to contact any outside world, would not let my father be seen by anybody and not receive phone call. And this young lady just got married, and her mother-in-law said, tell her husband, said, you know, I don't want to have a son that's mentally, a grandson that's mentally ill, crazy. So she forced a divorce out of this marriage. And, and she was crying her heart out. And the, the cry out said, where were you? I wish you were here outside of association for us. And that was the motivation for me and for, for all of us here from Alzheimer's Association to really want to reach out for the different, you know, it's not just Chinese community. You know, many community, I think including the mainstream community, we have the stigma. And, you know, fast forward 25 years later, um, right now I'm dealing with my mom, forgetful, and here I've been volunteer all these years, and I tell you, I'm still reluctant to take her for the diagnosis. And, and we finally did. She has MCI, mild cognitive impairment. It's you know it's a form of dementia, but it's not Alzheimer. Yeah, thank God. And it was like this. My father, is 88 years old, was walking with a walking stick, so he feels safer. My mom say to them, say, I don't want you to to use a walking stick because if they do, that means everybody know that I'm old too, so I don't want you to do that. But in the same token, my father doesn't want to admit his wife also might have a memory problem because that he think that he's less intelligent. People is not going to have the same respect. And I think that kind of uh, thinking we share in many, many community, not just Chinese community. And I think the only way we can overcome that is the proper education the outreach, the information, what is this disease all about, will make the difference. You know, long time ago, having cancer, the big C is a scary word, but not everybody accepts it. You know, people are not look at you less. But, so, there's a lot of work need to be done, a lot of progress has been made, but um, we are all here, we, have, we can conquer that together. Thank you, Tim. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Thanks. So, another, another voice, anyone? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Linda Rodesno, and similar experience to Fanny, I'm Hispanic, and my parents speak Spanish. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's about three years ago. And what I have experienced, my, my mother's family is a large family. My mom's in her 80s. Um, she has an old, my mother's the youngest daughter, my aunt also has Alzheimer's, is the oldest daughter. There's a 16 year span between them. But my aunt who has Alzheimer's, her family won't admit it or tell us. Um, so I, I found that in the Hispanic community, there is a stigma. I think it's a lack of education, a lack of knowledge. Um, you know, we've tried to talk to our family members about the importance of sharing some of the medical history um, because it will affect us all downstream and it's important that we have that information, but it's something that the community does not um, feel comfortable talking about, at least in my family and I know there's other families similar to that. The other thing I, I think is important that causes stigma, and, it, and again, I think it goes back to a lack of education is 
when we hear of athletes that commit suicide because they know they're going down that path. And um, my sister and myself were having a conversation about that. And I think if, uh, if their families could reach out to them and utilize them as a voice, and somehow we need to kind of tear down those walls and eliminate that fear and just help each other through the challenges that are faced out there. Make it easier for everyone. Thanks so much. Yes. My name is Auburn Daly. Um, I just kind of wanted to speak on the other side of stigma, not related to lack of education. Um, I lost my father five years ago. He was a cardio prominent cardiothoracic surgeon in Southern California, and his father had suffered from um, Alzheimer's. And so he knew this was a prospect, and the stigma was almost exclusively self-imposed. We couldn't, we called it the A word, we couldn't say the Alzheimer's word in our household, and, and we didn't sort of out of respect to him. Um, because he was a physician, we were very plugged into medical services, care services, and I mean, we had abundant resources, and um, still the stigma was so prevalent. And he, you know, commented, as the last speaker said at one point early on, if I know I'm going down that road, I'll just take myself out of the equation. Um, and mercifully, by the time he was down that road, he didn't have the faculties to execute on that threat. Um, and I just, I don't know, you know, this was someone who was highly educated, highly plugged in, knew the disease, knew the progression, and ultimately knew what was um, waiting for him there at the end. And so there's gotta be something else. That I think the way that cancer has become this real rallying cry, and people are perhaps not proud, but survivors and warriors and come, can often come out on the other side, that's the piece that we don't have with this disease. Um, people who made it through and you know, we have that now with HIV and AIDS um, after so much research. And so that's where I'm hoping this disease goes. But in the meantime, I think um, having celebrities, you know, speakers and supporters and people who are coming out and talking about it and giving a face without just feeling like this is shameful, I can't do what I used to do. I used to be high functioning, and now I'm, you know, a non-contributor. Um, I don't know who I am anymore. I think those are just um, stigma issues that, that can't. There's no 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 easy fix to sadly. You you touch on a wonderful series of, of points. Mm -hmm. Those of us in the community watched Glenn Campbell and Pat Summit. Uh, Glenn Campbell, singer songwriter, and Pat Summit, the uh, coach of the. Uh, Tennessee Volunteers won the basketball team, Hall of Fame uh, coach, come out and tell us, really, uh, this was significant because they said, I have Alzheimer's and I want to continue to work. I want to continue to do the thing that I've been doing. One of the changing faces of this condition, by the way, when I started with the association 25 years ago, I used to say I work for the Alzheimer's Association, but I don't see people with Alzheimer's, and that was true. Uh, I remember reading a, a, a geriatric physician in, in the South Bay on a huge Alzheimer's caseload who said, I've never met a self-diagnosed individual. He wouldn't say that today. There's an absolutely a changing face of this disease. In our advocacy efforts, when we go to Washington, D.C., there are dozens and dozens of people who are diagnosed with the disease who are part of this movement. We as a chapter have about 12 early stage groups now. Uh, because we're starting to diagnose the disease earlier and earlier as piece of people are lucid and insightful. But, but another quick statistic that is, you know, scares the heck out of me, 5.4 million Americans with Alzheimer's today, and over half of them, over half of them, will end their days without anyone telling them or their family that they had this condition. So maybe this, uh, somebody had a hand up here, and then I'm going to see if we can transition maybe to the physician and the research, because I heard some of that in your comments. Yeah. One thing, one, one unpopular thing that I've thought about off and on over the last time is that one of the things that promotes the stigma is this Maintain Your Brain campaign. Because I find people saying, I'm smart, so I can't have it. I went to college, I have a PhD, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, so I've maintained my brain. And that's just plain not true. 
It's not true. I mean, <laughs> we have so many spokespeople who have maintained their brain, whether it's in the music world, or the sports world, who have excelled in whatever their thing is, and nothing they have done has kept it away. And I would recommend that the Alzheimer's Association back itself away from the maintain your brain. I understand, I mean, I work on the helpline, so I tell people when they tell me that on the phone, well, it just means that you start up here when you have to fall, instead of starting here. But that's my way of excusing our campaign. So would anybody like to share their experience with their physicians? Uh, was it easy to have this recognized by your primary care docs? Uh, was it challenging? Uh, what's it like to, uh, what, what's the... Uh, I'll talk about it. Go ahead, Susan, over here. So, over here. Can I stand up or do you want me to sit down? Your choice. Whatever you want to do. Oh, okay, I'm just going to my legs. <laughs> so, um, my name is Susan Harbell and I am um, 30, 33 years old. No, sorry. 53 years old. We've been joking. I know we've been joking about that for a long time. So I was diagnosed in the, um, 2012, and for the most part, the doctors don't have a lot of solutions yet. Um, my particular doctor, I ended up, I went to, um, well, what really happened is I kept asking my husband the same question over and over. So then he talked to his doctor. His doctor referred me to, um, another doctor, and I ended up at Stanford. And the first person that I worked with wasn't as, um, he, did, he didn't have as much information. So I was so grateful, even though he drove, that guy drove me crazy, he got me to Stanford, so I'm grateful. Um, and uh, he, he, he was just, he was so blank about it. He said, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a um, solution yet. We don't have a way to take care of this yet. He says, but we're gonna do a trial. Do you wanna do a trial? I said, sure. I mean, take one for the team. I've been that way my whole life. You know, I, I, they, they, you know, because they have to sit down and tell you all the possible things that could happen, and well, you know, it is what it is. So, um, so the, I just felt that he was really helpful. I've spoke at a lot of his um, events where he has the research kids, I wanna call, they're not kids, but they're, they're um, younger than I am. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I've, I've met with them, and so that they can understand what it's like, and it's just, it's, it's so rewarding. You know, the idea of staying at home or whatever, it just, it's rewarding because you get to know more about what is going on, and you're not just in the corner like, well, she, she doesn't understand, so we'll just get her food for her, or whatever, you know what I mean? And I just, it gets that way. There's a lot of people, a lot of people are in overcare and they're doing it lovingly, but you know, so it is. So that's my. Are you want to take this from me? No, no, no. Okay, we're even. So, anyways, I um, I've been right, I've been on the um, on the on the road, and we've raised a lot of money, which is really important as well. And um, I haven't asked Kirshner for a donation, though I should. <laughs> So um, I just I think it's really helpful to have him um, involved and, and, and talking about different trials that are coming up and different drugs and everything. But um, and a lot of people there's like I said, I've said this the other day and I apologize you for hearing this. Is there's people that will come to me and they go, well if you drink coconut milk, that's what will save you. And I just and it just breaks my heart. I mean I'm the type of person who will go look all that up. I didn't really believe it anyways, but. But there's a lot of people that would just say, oh, okay, coconut milk, right on. You know, and, and, and so we don't need to deal with Alzheimer's. We don't need to support Alzheimer's because coconut milk's gonna take care of it. And I know I'm being a little snotty, but that's the kind of stuff that happens. Yeah. It's the woo-woo stuff in life. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. Thank you, Susan. Uh -huh. To finish on the medical end. Oh, wait, I want to say one last thing, sorry. Okay, well, I'm, I'm talking now. I, <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to say the other night, and I forgot, is Alzheimer's was love at first sight, I have to tell you. And I mean that. The association. Of the association. Yeah. The, because 
where do you go if we don't have you? And so that's why I, I was like, I meant to say that the other night. It's, just, it's love at first sight. It's like you get to know people. People aren't critical of you in those groups, and they're helping and supporting. And I mean, all, all my neighbors know what day that they don't work, that they can take me to a, you know, a doctor's appointment and stuff. So it's, it's pretty critical. That's great. The big tribe. It, it is, unfortunately, the big tribe. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to add the flip side of the medical experience, which was when my siblings and I took my mom to her doctor, her doctor kept saying, you don't have Alzheimer's, you don't have Alzheimer's, You're pretty, you look gorgeous. Well, she's 91 and she still puts on her earrings, but she's been doing that since she was two, I think. But she was you know, very good at confabulation and very good at manipulation and off the church social skills because of her involvement in the world and you know so we her adult children were ready to you know take that doctor out but luckily the association stepped in and helped us find some resources so well, the prisons are overcrowded <laughs> <laughs> the prisons are overcrowded yeah okay. thank you yes. oh, back over here thanks sir yeah, I think coming from the Hispanic community, I think there's some challenges there. Um, when my mom, was, when we first started noticing symptoms with my mom, she couldn't manage her finances. They always had a business, so she would start losing money. Um, my sister and, my, and myself got really concerned and took her to her physician who recommended a neurologist. But my mom had has been diagnosed for now about three years, but as I become more educated, I recognize that he was just really doing a cognitive um, test and has never really, she's never really been clinically diagnosed. She hasn't been through a full exam. Um, so I, although he's a really good neurologist, he doesn't specialize in Alzheimer's or um, geriatrics. So I, I am trying to find a physician and I'm looking into UC San Francisco where she could get some help in her language um, so that she could speak to somebody in Spanish and maybe we could help her more than what we're doing now. Dr. Seeley at UCSF, Dr. Yeah. Seeley. Absolutely. You want to say more? No, just thumbs up for Dr. Seeley. All right. Speak Spanish, I'm guessing. Uh, he has staff in his office. Okay. So, yeah, let's look. I was just going to say that the last topic, public awareness and diagnosis, go hand in hand, right? The more that we can promote awareness about the disease to the public and to physicians who really need it too, um, hopefully, um, the earlier the disease will be detected in people. You know, family members will pick up cues, understand and recognize the warning signs. Physicians will as well. And so uh, the first step is all of us showing up today. We obviously care about the disease. And uh, we can promote information in our own communities and to our, our elected officials. Thank you so much for being here, Mayor Kwan. I'm a resident of Oakland. My mom died here in Oakland with younger onset Alzheimer's. She was only 62 when she died. And it is a disease that, I mean, one in eight baby boomers will have it. And so the way I look at that, one in four baby boomers will be affected because you'll either get it or you'll be caring for someone with it. And so the fact that you're here and uh, you're listening to us all and you're aware that we live in your community and we're caring for people in your community means so much to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Leslie. I'm I go back to Washington, D.C. for our public policy forum most springs, and I remember years ago sitting in a legislative office with uh, a young aide, the aides all seem young now, um, <laughs> and uh, he was telling me, he said, my job here in the office for the congresswoman is to keep the top ten list. Every Tuesday when the congresswoman comes back uh, from the district, she wants to know what are the top ten things we're hearing about from the district. And he said, 
guns, abortion, and taxes will always be in the top three. Yeah. Your job, he said to me, is to be one of those other seven items. And I think that's exactly right. And, it, and it's a challenge. I'll tell you a quick story, and then I saw you had your hand up. I was riding in a, a golf cart, in a charity golf tournament here three or four years ago, and I was riding with a stranger and introducing myself as to what I'd do, and he said, oh, well, there at the end, you know, uh, Mom didn't remember the names of the kids anymore, but I don't think she had Alzheimer's. And why does it matter, we might say, but if he doesn't think that Mom had Alzheimer's, why is he going to care about federal funding levels for Alzheimer's research? And that's part of our challenge, I think. Can you hear Yes, my name is, I don't have much time, voice, excuse me, Karen Stevenson. <clears throat> and I lost my mom in December to Alzheimer's after 15 years. And my experience with doctors, I, I don't know this woman's name, but I think um, the stigma and the diagnosis issues are really finely intertwined. I think doctors, in my mom's case, they just did not want to say the A word. They wanted to say, oh, she's fine, a little memory loss. My mom was also very verbal and very interactive. And, they just didn't want to go there. And I think it relates to the fact that doctors want to heal. And doctors feel very upset. Um, and I don't, some of them don't care, perhaps. I think it's more that doctors want to be able to do something. And I, there's a study done that doctors, when faced with someone with a terminal illness, all, always, always overestimate the amount of time that the person has. Not because they might not know, but because they don't want to, they don't want to make people feel bad. And I think the same thing happens with Alzheimer's. And I think Part of the education process, of course, it's with us who are living with the disease, but I think it's very important for doctors to be educated and to understand how making a diagnosis earlier can lead to better outcomes, not perhaps yet change the ultimate result, but can make life better you know, in the interim for people with Alzheimer's and families. I think you make a wonderful point. There's a woman, Linda Boyce, at Oregon Health Sciences University that's published a, a, a a study with a series of focus groups with physicians, and that's exactly what you hear physicians say. You hear them say, well, it's an awfully sensitive issue. I don't want to upset the family. I'll just keep an eye on it. There's nothing I can do anyway. Uh, so I think you're right. It's not that sometimes they may know. It's one of the things, that, honestly, that worries me about the MCI diagnosis, that I, I have a hunch we're going to see a lot more people diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment just because it's easier for the physician to say and easier for the family to accept. Um, so, I do I see another hand here? Susan? Okay. Craig's, Craig's coming. I got another. I'm sorry, get me started. It's not good. Uh, but I work for Kaiser. And as you know, Kaiser is a big employer here in Oakland. And I would like to see the regional offices take Kaiser on, or challenge them, I should say, to get involved with this uh, out loud. There, there's a whole new movement about palliative care. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a list of issues that come to mind for me, which do have to do, maybe ultimately, with guns and taxes and whatever the third thing was which is that baby boomers, like Susan and myself, Susan was a vice president of, of human relations. Um, I'm a manager of health education. Um, we're dealing with Alzheimer's individually, personally, in our families, and professionally. And I think it is part of stigma. I used to work in alcoholism, a real conversation stopper. I uh, work in depression and mental health issues. Doctors also avoid that because, you know, I don't want to tell the family she has chronic depression. Well, too freaking late, you know? They've already been dealing with it probably for weeks and months. So let's get on the same team. But one of the issues I'd like to ask legislators to address would be the issue of how do we address confidentiality in the medical community and primary caregivers need to participate in that. It just, as I sit in my health ed office in the psych building and I listen to patients come in, <laughs> come on in and tell me all about your memory loss. And I'm thinking, really? What are they thinking, the psychiatry and psychology departments? 
And there's this legal hurdle that we have to address, which has to do with HIPAA requirements of, it, would there not be a way legislatively to say, if you have this diagnosis, you get to be the designated curer of all that information. You get access to the medical records. You get access. And when, I don't know when, maybe it's a family issue, maybe it's, you know, in Susan's case, she wants privacy with her doctor, fine. But then maybe there's an opportunity, you know, my mother wanted privacy, she didn't want to have this. But we just ramrodded our way into the meetings and doctors sort of backed off. But, but legislatively, there's an area there that needs to be addressed, so I don't know what the heck it is, that's why we elected you. But get that done with us so that we can have access to our mentally ill, brain ill patients' care and be a teammate. Maybe there's a family provision that we could add to the HIPAA regulations, let's say. So, thanks. Thank you. The comments that you made remind me, I think take me to thinking about research. So a quick, few quick words about research, then let's hear your thoughts about this. Currently, federally, we fund about $6 billion in cancer science, about $5 billion in heart disease science, $3 billion in HIV AIDS research, and $500 million with an M dollars in Alzheimer's disease research. Alzheimer's costs Medicare and Medicaid alone, just those two, $140 billion last year. We're having this huge national conversation about whether we can afford the Medicare program. If we could cure Alzheimer's tomorrow, I know we can't, but if we could, we could afford a lot more Medicare. So uh, I struggle with this issue all the time. The Alzheimer's Association is proud to be the largest private nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research. So we, we're funding folks at UCSF and Stanford right now, uh, and, and indeed around the, the world. Uh, but, but the amount of research funding we provide is very small compared to what the federal budget and the federal budget is very small compared to the need. That's part of why we care about this national Alzheimer's disease plan, because we want to leverage change in these things. Thoughts about research? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's nothing sexy or appealing about Alzheimer's. You you can't really have an Alzheimer's patient stand up and tell you their success stories, so people sweep it under the rug. I mean, we haven't had a success story. I mean, we have steps in the right direction, but instead of the athletes taking a stance just on the concussion side of it, how about the athletes coming forward and saying, you know what, I'm going to stand up and I don't have Alzheimer's, I could end up with Alzheimer's, I'm going to do some research on my own, and I'm going to represent this, and I'm going to put a national face on it. That's maybe something I could get behind. I'm sorry if that doesn't jive, but that's kind of all I have to say. Well, thank you. I think it's a, it's a great point. Yeah. In the back. I was just going to say, um, I have a friend at Berkeley who's getting his PhD, and he's going into research, so I talk to him sometimes about the potential to go in Alzheimer's research, and he just said, there's no money. You know, I can't get the projects funded that I'd want to do anyway. So he's decided to, you know, to go into leukemia and lymphoma, which is also a great cause, and, you know, we need scientists there, but he just said that he has no interest in going into to Alzheimer's because there's not a lot of opportunity for him to get funding. And so I think that that's a huge thing with, you know, people my age when I talk about it with them and, and his experience being out in the field of deciding what he wants to do his research in. So I think there needs to be more, more money so that it will appeal to young, to, to my friends and people that are in that field to go into that. So I, I would like more, more research for young scientists and innovative ideas. Great, thank you. Yes. So I, I'm going to talk of, of both of, of being the um, mother and the wife of a physician in terms of healthcare, and then, and then just some of my thinking as being the mayor of the city. Um, 
my husband um, runs, uh, used to run the, um, and now we're trying to get him to, to do a little less, but I was medical director at Over 60s, and it was founded by the Great Panthers. And um, part of taking on the issue of dementia is just part of having good health care in general, I think, for seniors. Because if you have a physician that doesn't see you very often, and I, I, I finally got a Kaiser doctor that I've had for more than five years, um, you know, Dr. Ing would probably tell whether or not I'm, I'm less capable or whatever, but many times in our healthcare system, physicians don't even know their patients well enough to see whether or not there's a diminishment or not. And one of the things that I've always been very proud about, about um, and it's an issue not just to get them more patients, because I don't know if they need them, they probably have a waiting list, but it's how you change the expectations about healthcare. So I know that when my husband gets a new patient, he spends 45 minutes, doesn't run any tests, he just spends 45 minutes talking to them and doing a really good history. So he has a baseline of who they are, why they are, what are the problems that we may expect because of their life, their, their, their family history, their lifestyle, et cetera. And um, it's, it, being a former patient advocate, it's just it's like, we've got to get healthcare back to um, good primary care where you actually have a physician who knows them. And the other great thing about over 60s is that they use nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, um, social workers, and it's really sort of a, they and the Center for Independent Living are more and more these one-stop places where you can get a lot of care. And I don't know how the Center for Independent Living will continue to survive if, if they take out Obamacare because they, they understand that if you do preventative care for seniors and they get more money per patient because if you do it up front, you're gonna really bring down the cost. So for example, um, I had just that patient diabetes I'm watching for diabetes in, in my, I, I don't get enough exercise, I'm overweight and I don't sleep enough, right? So uh, the, um, the whole changing people's lifestyles and integrating that and, and being more aware is important. So that's sort of the, the patient advocate side and how we have to, to reward systems that, and that's what Medi Medicare has been doing. It's like, so, so the Center for Independent Living and over 60s get more money because they keep people healthier, keep them living independent, keep them out of nursing homes and as much less, I mean, it's very expensive compared to what they pay the average doctor, but they keep people out of nursing homes and that's pretty critical for the state, which is why it was so stupid for the, some of the health state cuts that were made uh, this year because it was just, it's just push more people into nursing homes that the state can't afford. Um, as a mayor, I, I think that um, listening to this and knowing that we have an aging workforce, I'm wondering whether or not we might not be able to work with CalPERS and some of the big pension systems also to get the education um, out there in their mailers. We all get mailers from CalPERS for, for our pensions, whether or not we might be able to not do some of that. Um, I have a lot of programs uh, in the city where we have senior centers, which we finally were able to restore. And I, if anything, not only do I need to restore them, but I need to grow them. But we're trying to integrate our services so now that we have senior programs at rec centers, at libraries, and they're not isolated in senior centers. So one of the things that come that I'm thinking, so that once we do that, it's gonna take us another year to integrate it. We probably should do a citywide staff training on, on, on these kinds of issues, things that, that we cross-train for. So like, on one hand, we're cross-training all the staff to look out for truant kids and to call in and help the school district get them back into school. I think this is, a lot of, this is another generational citywide thing that possibly we could do to make sure, because we have so many, Boomers, a lot of us are going to retire. A lot of my friends are going to be never got married, um, never had a pension, and going to be on their own. And I worry about them all. So I'm trying to get them all hooked in. Well, you should go to a senior center. You should be involved in some kind of community group. Because I'm really afraid that if, if they develop something like else, they'll just disappear, and nobody will know <laughs> what happened to them, right? Because they're not, they don't have families, or that you know, they came out here a lot to take me. Some of my um, minority and gay lesbian friends moved away from their families to be out here, but they're by themselves. And so how do you build new families within the community that, that play that same kind of role? So those are just my thoughts. I want to thank you for inviting me. I have to chair a meeting in a couple of minutes and have to go and get brief. So, but I want to thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kwan. Yes. 
Mayor Kwan, thanks again for being here and for listening to concerns of people who live here in Oakland as well as other places. I like friends here, actually. So. <laughs> I didn't know if you know that the city of San Francisco enacted the first plan to address the um, Alzheimer's crisis. So it sounds like the we steal from San Francisco frequently. <laughs> so I will, I will, I will make it. We steal back and forth all the time, and so we have some city staff here and whatever. I'm sure we'll we'll look at that, right? Great. Thanks so much. Just wanted to make you aware of that. Thank you. Thanks again. So, what about caregiver support? What about long-term care? Gentleman in the back. Hi there. Um, my name is Rob Tufel. I'm from Jewish Family and Children's Services of the East Bay, and we run, um, I run our older adult program, so I'm going to be talking about it from more what, what I see professionally, but of course it's always personal as well. Um, so I really want to talk about three things. This one was long-distance caregivers. Um, uh, we see a lot of people here who are caring for parents that are someplace else that may have Alzheimer's, and I, I'm really always concerned about the people, the same thing, the people that are in this community that have Alzheimer's that may have children who live in, in someplace else um, as well, and I wonder what happens, what kind of services do those people get. The other thing that we have a food delivery program, and we see a lot of shut-ins, and those are people that will never get diagnosed, and there's really limited services that you can provide to them. We get calls on our information referral line from neighbors that will say, I'm worried about, I'm worried about my neighbor, she lives alone, maybe she has a caregiver, or he has a caregiver, they have no family, and there really are no resources for those people, and they'll talk about them maybe demonstrating some behaviors that are worrisome to them. We can call APS, but um, Adult Protective Services, but I think as a lot of you know, as, as, as good a job as APS does, what they can do is very, very limited. And I'm worried once again about those people that there really aren't services for those people who are on their own in the community. And the other thing with long-term care, of course, for us, um, there's two issues I would say. The first is money, that people can't afford long-term care. It's not covered by Medicare, as you know, won't pay for nursing homes. That's, that's one of the major challenges is for people, for families, for caregivers, is how can they pay for care. The other piece, I think, is train ger geriatric professionals who, can, who know how to care for people with Alzheimer's. Some of the people that we encounter who exhibit the most severe symptoms of Alzheimer's, whether it's aggressive behavior or whatever the behavior may be, some long-term care facilities won't take them even if they have the, the funding, if they have the money to pay for it because they can't, they can't be cared for. And once again, I think those people really were doing a disservice to them because we don't have something to offer them. So that's, that's the way I see it from my perspective, from those two issues. Thank you. Wonderful points that you brought up. Um, my father died in March of congestive heart failure, but he had Alzheimer's, and it was his Alzheimer's that made it hard for my 90-year-old mother in Iowa and so for our family, none of whom lived around them, trying to support my mom in this, through this process in a uh, community of 1,300 people, I mean, it was, there weren't a lot of resources. It, 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 the long distance issue was tremendous. And then about the, somebody else mentioned the issue of, of, I think Kimberly mentioned the issue of the, the young researcher making a decision. But I remember at one of these town hall meetings two years ago in Washington, D.C., uh, researcher or clinician from UC San Diego who teaches in their medical school standing up and saying yes at the end of their uh, medical of their their school work I can approach some of these students and tell them if they'd like to come and go to school for another year I can show them how to make less money <laughs> if they'd like to be geriatric specialists I'm sorry I just want to say one more thing yeah. which is very practical um, in terms of legislation Medicare needs, in my opinion, Medicare needs to be expanded to cover things like care management, to cover things like in-home supportive services, and as this population grows, as you all know, and the disease grows, we're actually cutting back on services. Even if we maintain the current level, we would still be in trouble. So one thing I think the Alzheimer's Association can do is advocate for increased services for Medicaid, Medicare um, to cover those things that they're not covering now. Wonderful, wonderful point. And just in terms of your point about adult protective services, it's one of those sort of under the radar issues where their budget here in California has been squeezed and squeezed. For organizations like yours and ours, we rely on these folks uh, for the live alones and the, those kind of problems that service in the community. A quick word about the HOPE for Alzheimer's Act health outcomes. Um, I was forgetting. 
Planning, thank you, and education. I always want to say prevention, but that's not it. Health Outcomes Planning and Education Act. You may know that in the Affordable Care Act, there is now uh, Medicare will pay for an annual wellness uh, checkup for seniors. Uh, and one of the things that the HOPE Act would do would be to pay physicians for an evaluate, a cognitive evaluation, not just the screening, but a full workup, in other words, diagnosing the disease. It would require them to put it in the medical record, and it would require the physician's office, it doesn't have to be the doctor, his or herself, but the physician's office to sit with the family for at least one brief, you know, but serious conversation about the plan, about what's ahead for this person. So it's absolutely a toe in the water on this idea. There's a lot of great data that says care coordination, care management actually can save the system money. And I think it's our obligation to prove this to our to our policymakers. Let's go here and here and here. And then before we wind up, I'm gonna ask our panel to say a few words about what they heard here this morning. Yeah, I'll share a few points. Uh, my parents, when we first started noticing problems with them, we were providing long distance care. Um, they were about 3,000 miles away from my sister and myself. And, um, and we, you know, money would start disappearing, we'd get odd phone calls, and we tried to cope with it by sending them smaller amounts of money so they would have more weekly allowances rather than larger amounts of money. Um, kind of took over their bank accounts and tried to manage it that way. But similar to um, the, the young man over here that spoke, we did find that people were taking advantage of them and that there was money being stolen or jewelry being taken. And that's when we made the decision to move them back. Um, it was a struggle moving them back. You know, they, they were losing their independence. But um, we did go through Catholic Social Services and found a caregiver to help during the day. Um, my sister and myself live about 100 miles away, and we care for them jointly, our family <coughs> them jointly. Um, we have a caregiver that comes in during the day. They stay with her during the week, and that allows my sister to go to work, and then she cares for them at night. Um, I care for them on the weekends. So we meet in Vacaville and have dinner every Friday night and every Sunday night so that we could do the, the big switch. Um, it's, it's challenging, you know, it really is challenging. Um, some of the things that I think would help is funding. Um, my father has Parkinson's, so it's an added element there. I'm sorry. Um, Recently, because his Parkinson's has gotten worse, we started looking into long-term care homes. It's $96,000 a year. And that's just for care. Um, so that doesn't include their medicine, it doesn't include their doctors, and we just can't afford it. So it's for us, it's finding that tipping point. When do we start? We don't want to run out of funds, so it's, um, you know, when do we start using their assets? When do we sell their home? We're afraid that if we do it too early, we're going to run out of money when we really, really need it. So, it's hard. It is indeed. Thank you so much. Zach? Um, well, I want to say thank you so much, um, and you in, in the back, sir, for alluding to the, um, the, the significant, obviously, cost of long-term care and nursing facilities. One thing that I just wanted to say that I've uh, recently, that has recently been brought to my attention is um, we were looking for a nursing home for my grandmother. Um, of course, when you have someone with Alzheimer's who is totally mobile and with, you know, six out of ten of them that wander, you want to have a locked facility and you want to know that they're going to be safe and that they're not going to wander and that they're going to be cared for in the way that they need to be cared for with that specific disease. And so one thing that, uh, one challenge that we faced was finding um, a place for her to live that was, you know, not in a, you know, not in the middle of nowhere, that was sort of easy, easily accessible 
and that um, accepted Medi-Cal. And um, there was um, there was different levels of care within a lot of different facilities that would, you know, uh, their skilled nursing centers specifically would accept Medi-Cal. But um, if you're going to use that, you may end up having to place your loved one with Alzheimer's in a particular unit of a certain facility or maybe in a, in a facility that does not have the capability to care for somebody with Alzheimer's disease that may be for an entirely different purpose um, that may specialize in those who are maybe immobile or maybe in recovery. And that's one thing that I think um, our policymakers need to be aware of is that um, it's undescribably difficult to place someone because everywhere you look, um, um, there, is, there is so few um, facilities that accept Medi-Cal and have the, capa the capacity to care for somebody with Alzheimer's in a locked, secured unit. And that, I think that's something that we really need to be aware of. And also, and also um, going back to the, um, the living alone issue, one thing that I, I can see and one thing that I've talked about with a lot of other people is um, I think when you have somebody who's living alone with Alzheimer's disease, and maybe their neighbors or friends that know it, they're often, they often operate under the assumption of the family is taking care of it and the family knows it. Um, I've met a lot of people um, who have known people with Alzheimer's disease and they try to stay out of it. And I think we need to sort of encourage them to um, say that, you know, I think the safety of the person is more important than getting to interfering in their lives because it's, um, as Elizabeth Taylor once said about people with AIDS, these people are taking time bombs. It's better to be a little excessively intrusive than to um, wait for a disaster to occur. <coughs> Susan, right behind you. Susan, behind you. Oh. Okay, I didn't know which Susan you were talking to. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so these little forums are great, and I really appreciate it, and I hope you'll be in San Jose soon. Um, just were. Because we're lost in Oakland. But it was a beautiful <laughs> rent. Okay. So, on the subject of funding, however, I, I think we have to sort of get a grip on what we're looking for in terms of government funding as well as private funding. And we got to get really creative how we do this. So, I would love to see us forming partnerships in the community to do things like, uh, you know, I'll call it piss everybody off here, but repeal Prop 13, uh, <laughs> repeal the death penalty, which you do have an opportunity to do, repeal the three strikes law, and instead of just building bigger frickin' prisons, that we get smart about um, how we use our money and think a little more long-term than just, you know, lock them up and throw away the key. And, you know, I probably say that because I went to Berkeley in the 60s, so go figure. Yeah, and I, I would like to see Alzheimer's Association sign on to a, a voter registration drive um, and really collaborate with whatever the heck party you're for to get seniors out to have caregivers be able to help them vote if they can still do that, uh, to get family support there, and, and to really get people to sign on. I'd also like to see partnerships. This is one of the things we're looking at at Kaiser with community organizations, giving more grants to um, the Alzheimer's Association, for example. We haven't, in San Jose, done that this year. I don't know why. It kicks me off. I'm going to find out. Um, but I think we have to, you know, there are no more 60s, 70s, and 80s. So that was a great time for mental health services and alcoholism resources and, you know, and yeah, and then things changed. Um, but I really would love to see partnerships with community organizations that are already doing this. So why can't we... You know, my friend at Stanford who's doing research with the, uh, another association 
was rejected by the Alzheimer's Association a couple, 15 years ago. Uh, so things have changed. Let's reach out to them again. You know, um, I, I, I really think we have to get creative. Let's work with our leukemia research people to figure out a way to make Alzheimer's stuff interesting, or, or stem cells people, or whomever. Collaborative efforts, I think, whether it's in neighborhoods with single family people, or if it's in organizations, private or public, uh, we got to get better at it. Thank you so much, Susan. I think we'll take one more comment from the floor, and then I'll ask our panel to speak, and we'll wind it up. Howard. Thank you, Bill. Uh, there is uh, some interesting things. There are some interesting things going on community-wise um, with the idea of getting involved in people's lives and keeping people seniors uh, in their homes. There's a a group called Ashby Village. It's part of the Village Movement, which started, I think, in Boston about 10 years ago. And there's a new group starting here in North Oakland as well, where volunteers actually work in the community to help people who are elderly and need help staying in, who want to stay in their own homes and stay in their community. So these uh, volunteer, this volunteer corps basically helps uh, take them to doctors for doctor visits, drive them to the grocery store. Uh, this is something that will affect people who are in the early uh, part of the disease to help them stay in their homes and stay within the community and get the kind of support that they might not be able to get from family if their if family doesn't live here. So Ashby Village uh, and the Village Movement is, is a way of getting involved in trying to keep people in their environments and in their homes safely. Thanks, Howard. I just a, a piece I wanted to mention after Zach was speaking. If you don't know, uh, Zach referred to Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is the California version of the federal Medicaid program, which is the U.S.'s uh, long-term care program. That's really it. That's how we, to your point, incredibly expensive. When I started with the association 25 years ago, there was one, actually it was here in Oakland, there was one uh, residential care for the elderly that specialized in people with Alzheimer's disease. A woman named Carol Kehoe uh, took care of her mom and bought a house to take care of her mom, and then uh, took in three or four other folks who had Alzheimer's. And that was it. And but but all of the long-term care for Alzheimer's was in the skilled nursing license. That's changed drastically over the last 25 years. But if you are poor, if you run out of, of assets. Uh, the only place the Medicaid, Medi-Cal dollar will go right now is to skilled nursing, and there are fewer of those options for families all the time. I'll just add one more comment. It's another challenge is finding services that will help in a different language. Um, you know, the, the challenge I've experienced is my father's diabetic, he's Parkinson's, has limited mobility, my mother has Alzheimer's, and they speak Spanish. Hard to find facilities that can help them. And I don't want them not to have the ability to communicate, which makes it even more challenging. Is this Daniela? Mm -hmm. uh, joined us while we were talking uh, from Congresswoman Barbara Lee's office. So I'm going to, if you, you want to start? Sure. Okay. I apologize, um, I was late. I was actually on a conference call. I was supposed to be 30 minutes and it ran about two hours. So um, I actually meet with, uh, I met with Howard um, and advocates from the Alzheimer's Association have come into the office and, and really expressed everything that you guys are expressing today. So um, I appreciate them reaching out to our office and making sure we're here. Um, the Congresswoman is a co-sponsor of the HOPE Act. I'm pretty sure she is. <laughs> um, and she'll continue to support um, increased funding for research. Um, and she hears all of the issues that come along with taking care of a family member um, who has um, health issues. She has a mother who's elderly. Um, her sister has MS. She took care of her elderly aunt who was, I think, 102 for a very long time. Um, so she's been in and out of emergency rooms. She's had issues with doctors um, who don't give her family members the care that they, she thinks she feels that they deserve. So she's very much used to 
having to fight for care um, for, for her loved ones. So uh, thank you all for sharing your personal stories. Um, and if you guys have any questions specific to our office, please, um, I'm here. And I'll, I'll give you my business card if you'd like to email me something later as well. First of all, thank you all for coming out and sharing your stories and your suggestions. I will quickly say my husband died two months ago after a valiant battle with this devastating condition. I serve, as Bill said, on the National uh, Advisory Council for NAPA, National Alzheimer's Project Act. And I assure you, um, the pages of notes I have taken will be shared with our 25 members on that council. But more importantly, I'd like to remind you to do what you have done today. Speak out. Speak out. When we go to Washington and meet with the policy makers and do our job, remember what Bill said. They listen to us if we make our voices heard. Be the sands in the shoes, okay? Don't let people get comfortable with this. When I look back over what my family, my husband, went through for 12 years, no, I will not be quiet. I want you to be the person that when you show up, people will say, oh, here he comes again. Right on, right on. Oh, here he comes again. Right on. With your families. I'm there with you. With your community work, speak up. Don't be nice. Don't be ugly, but, <laughs> but make sure that people know your story. You know, I remember as someone said, when cancer was something that no one talked about. We've got to get out there, people. It starts with us. People like the Alzheimer's Association and NAPA and all of this, we're working hard, but we need you. Excuse me if I have tears. I am so excited about what you have brought to this forum. Now go out, take it into the world. Okay, and I'm not a preacher. <laughs> Well, I'm short, but I feel like I'm both shorter and taller right now. I'm shorter because I'm feeling all of your burdens. But I'm taller because, as Gary just said, it's the stories that help influence policy changes. You want your story to be the story that that politician is telling on the campaign trail. We were so excited, I think, several years ago, I think Ruth, you might have been there when um, we got to hear Clinton um, in San Francisco and he mentioned Alzheimer's. So we want in these presidential debates that are coming up to somehow Absolutely. mention Alzheimer's. One other thing I just wanted to say is that everybody dealing with this disease, when you hear about what everybody is going through, and when you hear from the professionals about what they're faced with, it seems overwhelming. It seems like there are so many obstacles. There are small pockets of really wonderful, wonderful work that's, that's been going on. So it's very hopeful. And I don't want anybody out there who is doing some of this great work but runs into roadblocks to say, ah, their problem, not my problem. I don't want us to say that either. I want us to say when there's a problem, when there's a HIPAA privacy issue that's uh, 
being a, a barrier to getting information. I want us to say, well, let me think if I could come up with a way where we can get closer to a solution. So I want to thank you for, for coming out. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to all of you. So um, this is this is both different and typical, right? Um, the stories vary so much and yet they have many common themes. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when as I listen to this, our job as the Alzheimer's Association, as the national movement to defeat Alzheimer's, is to change these facts. To change these facts so that we convene again with you know, a hundred times as many people in five years, and some of these stories have changed. The level of Alzheimer's research funding is different. The, uh, the, the resources in the community, the care options for caregivers are different. The level of support is different. The, uh, the uh, access issues for rural folks and, and communities of color are different than they are today. Uh, that's our job. I want to point out two things, two ways in which I want to encourage you to think about being part of this. One is, you should absolutely sign one of the advocacy cards in the back if you haven't done this. So we got the National Alzheimer's Project Act passed. Uh, HHS came out with the first ever plan for Alzheimer's disease. And before the plan was announced, the president said, I'm going to find another $50 million in the NIH budget for Alzheimer's science. And I'm going to ask the Congress for another $80 million next year. Now, that's $130 million. It's you know, not what we need. It's not the $6 billion that, that cancer research gets. But it's a step in the right direction. And you can draw a direct line between volunteers with clipboards at Walk to End Alzheimer's, signing up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of advocates from Seattle to San Diego, from Dallas to Chicago, from New York to Miami. We have 14 walks in our territory. Uh, I'm going to be in Modesto tomorrow for a walk there. I was in Reading last weekend. Uh, the San Francisco walks, one of the largest walks in the country. We had about 7,000 people there last year. That's what we have our first ever uh, East Bay walk in Walnut Creek in Santa Cruz. Um, what is it? Santa Cruz. We have a walk in Santa Cruz. Yeah, we have a walk in Sacramento and Chico and Reno and Monterey and Fresno and Stockton. Oh, wait, that was yeah. Pardon? <laughs> Petaluma, of course, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but the point is, when I see this walk, when I'm there at this thing, it just, it just jazzes me. Because that's what a national movement to defeat Alzheimer's disease looks like. I, I also am a child of the 60s. And having this huge crowd of people out, uh, it, it, you know, you hear these stories and it's easy to get down, right? There's a lot of this that is incredibly hard and it is relentless and it goes on and we lose this fight month after month, day after day, and, and in the end we lose our, our person with this disease. And when you're at that walk, you know you're doing something about it. You know you're fighting back. Uh, and we will change the things that we heard today. We'll do it together. Can't hire enough people to do this. It's got to be people who volunteer and who care about it who are going to get this done. So you heard it from, from uh, Reverend Woolfolk. Uh, <laughs> Get out there and, and uh, tell your tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell the folks at, at church, at your gym. Bring them into the cause. Thanks so much. Yes.